This is the Annex, a sociology podcast. I'm Joseph Cohen from the City University of New York. Today, an interview with Michelle Silver on coping with retirement. Michelle Silver is a professor at the University of Toronto and recently published Retirement and Its Discontents, Why We Won't Stop Working Even If We Can with Columbia University Press. My co-host for this episode is Gabriel Rossman of UCLA. This episode was originally broadcast on May 1st, 2019. And now we turn to Michelle Silver from the University of Toronto. Michelle is an expert in gerontology and life course, and she is coming out with a new book, Retirement and Its Discontents, Why We Won't Stop Working, Even If We Can, with Columbia University Press. And Michelle, this is a really interesting topic. You know, on one hand, it's common to see work as like a burden, a yoke around our necks. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of us think of retirement akin to what maybe a prisoner thinks of parole, right? Like we're released from the burden of work. But on the other hand, you know, we know that work is like integral to our identity. And as we age, it becomes like a major venue for meeting people. It gives us a reason to put on clothes in the morning. And so maybe retirement isn't as simple as, you know, the the Freedom 55 crowd might be suggesting it is. Can you tell us a little bit about your study uh retirement like what goes on when people face retirement yes you raise a number of really great points i think that most people actually associate retirement with freedom mm-hmm. and I, I in my book i'm looking at a subset of people um people for whom their personal identity was really closely intertwined with the work that they did with their mm-hmm. life's work and um and so you know when they retired um they they found it to be a real letdown. Uh, many of them were looking forward to it um, and, you know, thought it would be this great time to enjoy the fruits of their labor. And mm-hmm. instead they really struggled um, to recalibrate their sense of self-worth. And so my book is, you know, a series of studies that I did with different types of people for whom their life's work was um, the way they defined their personal sense of who they were. So I, mm-hmm. I interviewed doctors, I interviewed CEOs, um, elite athletes, people who had uh, represented their country in Olympic games, mm-hmm. um, academics, someone you, you, mm-hmm. you, this audience might be able to relate to a bit and, um, and also homemakers. And so they were all they had this, you know, degree of similarity that I mentioned, but they were also strategically different from one another and strategically different in ways um, that related to uh, the way we think about the word retirement, um, mm-hmm. some trying to sort of pull on um, and play with the idea that, you know, like, a, oh, we don't think of homemakers as being able to retire and athletes, you know, they retire so young. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, the basic idea was to get us to really question the relationship between work identity and age and, and retirement um, that we have in society. Interesting. Can you start us off by telling, like, what happens to people, or at least your subjects, when they retired? So they're, you know, they get the watch, they're looking forward to seeing the grandkids and, you know, watching afternoon baseball or whatever. But what what's the reality that confronts your subjects that they find dissatisfying? So, yeah, so each of the participants that I um, interviewed, I asked them to, you know, walk me through their career highs and, you know, their trajectory into um into their life's work and then, um, and then their retirement. And it usually, you know, was, um, strategically marked by a party, by a retirement Mm -hmm. party. And from there it was, it was different for each person, right? I mean, some of the academics interviewed were, you know, at the retirement parties and listening to people talk about themselves in ways that sounded like a funeral and Mm -hmm. were literally like plotting out the next article that they would write (laughs) during (laughs) their retirement party. Uh And, um, and, you know, and others were, you know, having um, great experiences after we're, you know, going and having travels and, Mm. and there's that, but, but most of them, um, what they talked about was, you know, coming to this point where it was, it was an experience that was a letdown that was, you know, suddenly they didn't have a way to feel distinguished. They didn't have a sense of fulfillment from their day to day activities. And, and like each one was really quite different mm-hmm. um, in terms of the ways that they experienced discontentment in retirement. 
Hmm. And the point is that it's a big contrast to the way that, you know, most media advertisements and billboards that you see really emphasize retirement as this, you know, wonderful time to go uh, have a walk with your partner on the Mm -hmm. beach and go on cruise ships and spend endless amounts of money. Yeah. (laughs) How much how much does financial insecurity factor into uh, discontent? Well, I think it depends because, um, you know, for many, financial insecurity will put them back into the workplace. Right. And um, and so then that's a different form of retirement. And that's one of the things that I play around with and reason why I was so interested in, in studying, why I've, I've made much of my career um, focused on studying the concept of retirement is that there are so many different ways to um, to define retirement to think about what does it mean at the individual and the societal level. Um, But in terms of financial insecurity, I mean, yeah, I'll be the first to say that like everybody should plan financially um, and should, you know, be aware of, of the fact that the market, the stock market can take a dive that your um, portfolios can change and that being financially insecure is no fun at any age. Yeah. (laughs) But money's not the only challenge that people face. What are what are the other challenges that people find difficult when they're having a tough time with retirement? Yeah. So right, like if you can put finance and health aside, mm-hmm. um, because those are both two really important issues that will compromise and influence the way a person experiences retirement. Um, the sort of less commonly discussed aspect is. Um, is the more sort of personal and uh, societal impact of retirement. Um, and that's to say that, um, yeah, for a lot of people, it's, it's an experience of social exclusion. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you, you know, so like, for example, I, I interviewed um, CEOs who, you know, every day was scheduled by their three administrative assistants and, mm-hmm. and they just got used to like walking in the door and you know, being in charge and being in demand. And, um, you know, one of the one of the um, individuals, one of the participants, was describing for me um, the experience of feeling like uh, he, he talked about it, like you know, longing for his mistress, which he you know apparently had some experience with, and, and he was saying he was like you know it, it, to go from being the one in charge to suddenly nobody's calling, nobody needs right. me, nobody's giving me any attention anymore. Um, was a was a real sort of slap in the face, and he, you know, and he said to me, "It would just be nice just to know that I was still desirable, just to know that, you know, every once in a while, just to get a call to know that I was still in demand." And um, and, and I never mind that he couldn't figure out how in the world <laughs> to keep his appointments because suddenly, you know, technology had changed, mm-hmm. and suddenly, like he had to figure out how to keep his, um, you know lunch with his buddies and that was a challenge for him because he had literally three administrative assistants planning a schedule um so you know that's a very extreme opposite end of social of uh, financial insecurity example you know it reminds me though i remember having uh, so my father is in his mid 70s and sometimes i'm interested in well-being as a topic and i remember having a discussion with him because you know he's been around for a long time so i asked him you know over the life course when do you think overall well-being is at its highest and uh, his answer was kind of interesting he said you know probably around your age i'm 42 years old he said probably in my mid 40s and he goes you know at that time you got the kids hanging off you and the job is a hassle and you think that you know you're just overburdened but what you don't realize is that you're you're overburdened because you're so central to so many different people and he says as you age you get pushed to the periphery and you realize that all those demands on your time were in fact an embarrassment of riches and that part of the problem is dealing with marginalization it's it's much worse to have pe- nobody care about your opinion than to have people clamoring for it that's fascinating yeah i think i think that there's a lot to that um yeah, I'd I'd love to like hear more of advice from your dad. <laughs> I think oh. that's that's pretty awesome. I mean, I think that's true, and and I think so much of um you know we don't we don't think about age about the marginalization that is associated with aging that much. 
Um, mm-hmm. But it is, you know, something that if we're lucky enough, all of us will experience, right? Like yeah. if we don't die young, we yeah. all will <laughs> age. And, um, and sure, to say that, um, you know, being busy, the busy ethic, that that is what, you know, keeps us happy is really interesting. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways to think about that. I, I guess in terms of the like, when we're most happy in the life course, I can't help but think about Laura Carsonson's work and mm. social selectivity theory and just how like, when our time horizons are shrinking, that we sort of optimize behaviors and think about more positive things or that those become more important to us. Yeah. And, um, and, and so, you know, along with that, there's been a bit of research suggesting that in later adulthood, we're happier, um, you know, closer to, to your dad's age is yeah. supposed to be the more happy time, right? You don't have all those demands, but I, I definitely think that for a subsector, mm-hmm. for people who did really well on the marshmallow test, Right, mm-hmm. people who are really good at delaying gratification and are overachievers, mm-hmm. um, and who've you know constantly been trying to move up the career ladder and have have really you know given into um, letting their work dominate all other spheres of life. Mm-hmm. You know, like Kozer um, would say, you know, have given into the greedy institutions. Mm-hmm. I think that for those 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 of us who've done that um, or are in those kinds of jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, retirement can be, yeah, a real time of marginalization. Most of our adulthoods have been characterized by and dominated by work. And when work lets you go, mm-hmm. <laughs> whether yeah. it's because, you know, you receive the signals that you're no longer um, productive or um, deemed to be important enough mm. and, you know, sort of scooched towards out the door then um, it can be a really harsh adjustment. So I'm, I'm wondering how much of this, you know, so there's potential confounders, right? Because most of us retire when we're in our late 60s or early 70s, um, typically late 60s. And, um, and so there's obviously a big change in time use and meaning and everything like that. But there's also just a simple fact of aging. And um, so I was really interested to hear that you used athletes, right, who retire much younger. Now, they, they in some ways can age um, faster than some of the rest of us, particularly if they did a contact sport. You know, yeah. if you've ever seen a retired football player walk, it's not pleasant looking. Right. Um, but, you know, th- but for the most part, they're still young when they retire, middle aged when they retire, right? Most of the, almost all yes. of them retire younger than I am. Yes. Um, right. So, h- how does that kind of give you a almost natural experiment to um, unpack? You know, here's people who have a lot of meaning associated with their career, um, but they retire from their main job, at least, uh, extremely young. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, they, they, by definition, they retire when their bodies are no longer able to perform at their peak um, ability. And so, um, and that, you know, is, is early in the life course. And, and I, I included them intentionally to play around with the idea that retirement is in the time frame that you described, right? That, mm. um, and that that was intentional because I I want to make the point that if people associate retirement with a specific chronological age, or if we as a society do that, then we're really losing out on a lot of potential um, and uh, potential contributions to society, and um, and that individuals often will just, you know, get to that point, like 65, uh, you know, Canada was freedom 55, as Joe was um, citing, lots of people remember those ads. Um, yeah, US more, it's it's more like 65. And, um, and that, I think, can be problematic in the sense that there is really nothing predictive of your age, I think, in adulthood, um, beyond telling you when's your next when your next birthday is going to take place. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so the athletes, you know, were there to introduce that and to also, um, you know, through their stories, they sort of made the point that, um, that it was challenging, that making the transition to doing other kind of work, um, was difficult. Like, you know, some of the athletes I interviewed went on and made a lot of money, um, had very demanding high pressure careers, but they would tell me how nothing they ever did would 
measure up to the adrenaline rush that they got from competing right. and, um, and, you know, and being in demand the way that they were for what they considered to be their life's work. And the transitions that they made to other kinds of uh, professions, jobs, uh, what have you, you know, there was the whole range. I mean, athletes are quite interesting in that way because some of them, uh, you know, doesn't being an athlete or an elite athlete doesn't necessarily predict what kind of work you're going to do next. Mm -hmm. You know, lots of them go into coaching. But but anyway, you know, the point was to say that the transitions that they experienced were sort of telling. Like we often in gerontology will look to older adults and 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 try to use their experiences to apply to earlier parts of the life course. And here was this, you know, really young group of people, but describing things that were akin to um, the ways that people later in adulthood described. Interesting. So um, I, I wonder if the, what the findings would be like if you had professional dancers um, who as a rule retired around 24, mm -hmm. which is even younger than athletes, I imagine. And it's, you can imagine it being so young mm -hmm. that, you know, they, they have to have another career mm -hmm. uh, after that. And, you know, maybe in their case, they derive meaning from that new career. But, you know, I, I, it wouldn't surprise me if they're basically the same as other people who put intense physical demands on their body, like athletes. Yeah, well, I mean, so I, I um, so one of the um, participant whose story shared in the book is, a, was a gymnast. And, um, and, you know, and so her, she retired by 21. And, um, you know, and the challenge, and sort of contrast to what you just suggested is that, you know, she had spent her entire childhood focused on her gymnastics. Mm -hmm. And she, um, you know, she had like pretty much moved away from her parents by early childhood and, you know, never to go back and, and live with them again. And, and so by the time she retired and, you know, she did very well meddling, et cetera. Um, she, but she didn't have a plan B because mm -hmm. it took everything. It took all aspects of her being to be able to focus on her routine, which she practiced six days a week for mm -hmm. at least eight hours a day. If she got the routine right for, you know, something like 15 years or more than that, I mean, around that amount of time, right. Which is the equivalent of, of a career. Um, and, and so, you know, the, while it is true she did have youth, she found the transition to be really challenging in a number of different ways. And and one of those was the idea that, you know, she was no longer important for the reasons that she had been for most of her life. And, you know, so she said she would meet people and 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 they would say, Hey, what are you doing now? And, you know, and just I remember, she was like in her, tw she was 21 when I interviewed her. And she said, people said, what are you doing now? And, and, and she would say, you know, I, I'm, I'm still important. You know, I'm still, my name is still, I'm still who I am, but mm -hmm. I, I can't say that I'm a gymnast anymore. And, and because of that, she just felt it really caused her to um, have to do a double take on, on who she was as a person. Mm -hmm. is is it is it the loss of personal purpose or the loss of a mission or is it the loss of social esteem or is it both that bother those who retire at any age? I I think that you know when you are somebody who gives one hundred and ten percent to your work, um, mm -hmm. so you know for example many physicians are you know acculturated through the institution of medicine to. Um, prioritize their work over over everything else that they do, right? They're woken up in the middle of the night when they're on call and they're immediately expected to jump into this role, which quite mm -hmm. often does involve life or death decisions. I mean, obviously, depending on the type of medicine that you practice, mm -hmm. but um, but it can, right? Like, unlike us, right? Like, we don't make life yeah. or death decisions, right? Thank goodness. Like a sociology emergency? Yeah, yeah. But you know, but nonetheless, you can kind of relate. I mean, the tenure process, yeah. going through the process of tenure, like it really forces you to, um, to focus in on work and to prioritize it. Because if you can't, there's a million other people who will, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> who will do that. So, so I think that, um, I think that for people like that, like I said, people who do well on the um, marshmallow test and, you know, can delay gratification um, and, and prioritize their work that when they, when they come to the end of the tunnel, um, it can be really hard to remember 
oh yeah there's a marshmallow <laughs> oh yeah i get to eat that marshmallow oh yeah i forget what it even tastes like and and it and it may not taste that good as you remembered it yeah if if you don't i'm not saying all academic i'm not saying everybody is going to be this way i mean right. This is, you know, again, like I'm really careful in the book to um, include a big methodological appendix and to and to explain that, like, this sentiment is really not meant to be generalizable. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think it it's really interesting. <laughs> we're uh, we're kind of looping in a way back to the chase segment mm-hmm. where yeah. you know, the overall theme of this uh, week's string of episodes is uh, eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we shall die. <laughs> yeah. also because, or rather eat, drink and be merry because, you know, you're not going to be able to afford a mortgage anyway. <laughs> One of the two. <laughs> but it's also interesting because, you know, those parallels, I, you, you have me thinking about, you, you know, those who have difficulty making the leap from a doctoral program to a long-term academic job. And people are like, well, why don't you just get a job in industry? But it's kind of a similar thing, right? If somebody goes to get their doctorate, they spent like probably a decade orienting their identity and their conception of their self as an academic. And for somebody to be so flip and be like, well, just go work for a marketing company or an HR outfit, it's probably not as easy as, as, uh, you know, as that advice would presume. Yeah, I've always wondered, like, I, I, I've i always had a similar thought of, like, you know, there's kind of a puzzle of why the labor supply is so big for adjuncts. Yeah. And in one sense, the reason it's so big is because is obvious. It's because we produce too many PhDs relative to the mm-hmm. size of the assistant professor lines. But, you know, the other, but that doesn't completely solve the question because then it implies, like, why don't people quit? Yeah, totally. You know, and I think, like you're saying, it's basically because you spend – you know, uh, four to 10 years in graduate school, basically having your habitus shaped to the extent that you can't imagine doing anything else. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a disability. I went through graduate school the entire time thinking I could possibly end up a business consultant and I was fine with it. And it totally was great because I think it preserved my mental health in some way. But that's that's getting off topic. The, the, what about Michelle? Those who do retire well, what do they do? I think they do what you just described. You know, I think like I think you're going to be just fine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I mean, and I, I mean, I think, you know, being open to having a plan B <laughs> is like a great, you know, throughout your life um, is a great way, I think, to um, ameliorate the transition if you end up in a, the line of work that is in a greedy institution that demands everything of you. If you can always kind of keep in in the back of your mind, like you know, I, I, I can do other things. I do have other aspects of myself. And, you know, I think that the, the trick is just like you were, you were both just saying that people kind of get stuck. They get stuck in the, you know, idea that there is only one way to contribute to society. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, and that is, that is, you know, in whatever subfield that they're in, um, or, or they get stuck in terms of being unable to, uh, be marketable right. in different types of jobs, right? And I mean, th- those are those are big issues. But you know, I mean, nowadays, like we we can work anytime, anywhere. Most most people, I mm-hmm. mean, not not everybody, but but um, but that can kind of uh, bring on the omnipresence of work. And um, and if you kind of buy into that, um, it can make separating or other aspects of your life really difficult. And so the extent to which it's possible to have other interests, other aspects of yourself I think those people you know the people that I interviewed who were able to be more well-rounded or um, you know to get enjoyment from aspects of their life that were not only the one that they were also being paid for right um, that 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 behooved them I mean you know because we all have this fantasy that like I'm doing the thing that makes me most happy that I would do this for free that you know I love what I'm doing and and you know that I think that can be fine. I think it, you know, so long as you work till you die. And mm. and part of my point is to say that why shouldn't you know for lots of types of work, you should be able to work till you die. Like there's so much um, intergenerational tensions, and I've written a couple of papers, not not in the book, but other other work that speaks to that idea that there's this idea that older workers and younger workers are that were substitutes for each other. And, and, um, and I think that that, that's really complicated. That really complicates things. You know, I, I hear from 
colleagues will say, you know, what what about the yeah. what about the colleague who like really should retire that we can't wait for them to retire, and um, and you know, and I just I just think about the other end of the spectrum that you know, there's also um, individuals that we take huge risks on when they're early in their career and and who make all sorts of mistakes and yet we don't you know we we don't necessarily you know we let them prove themselves and um and so as a society and that's you know part of the argument here is to say that as a society we really ought to give pause to this idea that a chronological age should dictate when people stop making contributions mm -hmm. they used to have do they still have mandatory retirement in the canadian academy or did they get rid of that no, it's pretty well gotten rid of. Um, yeah, there there's few exceptions. You know, airline uh, pilots. Um, you know, the the the, the numbers of uh, occupations where there's still mandatory retirement is uh, is quite. Uh, it's it's not so common now. Um, but you know, I, I I've interviewed people who who did who you know experienced mandatory retirement um, in in, ac in academic institutions and otherwise, and you know on the one hand what was what's interesting you know on the one hand it, like it's not helpful at all to be pushed or forced into anything, mm -hmm. but on the other hand then there was the planning aspect of it where they they could they they could give themselves time to think about what was going to happen next because mm -hmm. they had no choice about it. Right. No choice except for to do that because that was the rule. It was mandatory. And I, I think that's sort of interesting because the way it is now, there is there are these financial incentives, but there but it's not a rule. But then we're finding a lot of people opting into it and and then we're sort of losing out on potential contributions. Mm -hmm. And and anyway, and for the sake of pension systems, it gets really complicated the way we oh, have yeah. it right now. <laughs> the, there's a uh, uh, an intro. I don't want to. Uh, uh, this will be the second and, and last time I quote my father on this. It's just we've talked about this so often, and he could have very well been one of your subjects as a as a doctor. But I remember him also telling me something uh, along the lines of, I, I, "I was asking why he didn't retire." And he goes, "So he says, listen, son, I'm going to wake up, I'm going to have a meal, I'm going to read the New York Times, I'm going to walk around the block, and now it's eight forty five in the morning. What am I going to do right. between now and when I go to bed?" How much of it is just the difficulty of filling a day? How many people do you see just have trouble finding something to do, anything to do? Yeah. I mean, I can't tell you how many times people said to me when every day becomes a weekend, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when it becomes interchangeable and uh, between a weekday and a weekend, uh, it it can be uh, <laughs> a quite discontenting experience discontentful experience you know <laughs> yeah. however you want to say the word it's not uh it's it's really tricky right and you know on the other hand like there are lots of people for whom every day is an autonomous experience and planning mm. out what they're going to do you know i can think of people in the creative professions and in academia like where you know, it's like, I know, I know how to plan a day. And, mm. um, right. And like academics, we plan out whole semesters, right? Like, we're quite good at thinking through uh, scheduling. And so I would say that, you know, it's, it's not, it's not just about that. It's also about um, being important and connecting with other people. Um, it's not just about, you know, I don't know how to schedule my day because I, you know, I'm, I'm quite sure like if you're, if your dad was hard pressed, he would, he would be able to find lots of interesting things, right? Lots of um, retirement seminars will, will propose, you know, continuing education and, and like I myself have like a whole list, you know, if, when I get asked to give talks, I have a whole list of strategies and ways um, that one can fill their day. But I just think it's really important to also acknowledge that, um, that when society associates age with productivity or creativity or or contribution mm -hmm. period it it's it's really tricky when you reach that age and people just assume that you're no longer um useful going to be able to contribute yeah useful yeah. i have only one more question over the the process of watching people you know uh cope with you know the end of their work life have you developed any opinions about, you know, how much of life is, you know, you talk about the marshmallow test a lot. 
and how when they ultimately get the marshmallow, it's not as tasty. And sometimes the goals we set are just motivators or they give us a rationale to put our pants on in the morning and pursue something. It's the pursuit that matters. Do you, do you see evidence of that? Like, is it that, you know, once you, one of the challenges you reach at the end of life is you don't have sort of these long-term goals to work towards and that causes problems. I've always wondered that. I think it's always helpful to have goals at, at either point, you know, at any point early in the life course. And I think it's, it's just as important later in the life course. I mean, it's funny cause I don't even mention the marshmallow test in my book. I think I might be hungry or something. It was like, I keep, I keep thinking of like analogies, which I didn't make there, but you know, I, I, I started to think about retirement kind of like the banana um, just today. <laughs> and, and I think I, I read something recently about how, you know, bananas, um, they, they're about to go extinct, right? That we're not, I didn't know the, that. The, the bananas that we know of, um, what is it? The Cavendish banana is the one that like dominates now. And, and then and the, the older machine, the older uh, banana already went extinct in the 1960s. No way. And yeah. Yeah. So the, yeah. The gross Michelle banana that was popular in the early 20th century went extinct around 1960 and then took them a few years to develop the Cavendish. Yeah. And it's going to go extinct soon. Oh, no. Yeah. And it's it's fascinating. I mean, I think like it's it's like retirement where it seems like this really boring topic that like what? Like it was so common and ordinary and you hear about it all the time. Um, but then when I when I learned all this about the bananas, which is just I realized there's there's quite a bit of overlap. Like they, both of them were kind of rare before the late 19th century. Um and they're both kind of like when they came into being, they were initially these kind of exotic I, uh, objects slash concepts and, um, you know, reserved for like this small segment of the population that could afford them or yeah. that were, you know, given access to them. And now they're like everywhere. Um, and, you know, they both like, you know, bananas that come in this nice packaging, um, mm -hmm. right? They're like a really health oriented type of thing and and retirement is too like there's these nice retirement packages people have um and and it's it's um and then the thing is that when i heard about the idea that the um banana is about to become uh, there's this fungus right that's about to to make the them no longer um what they are which is like the fourth most important crop that we have hmm. um it, it made me think about how you know our understanding of retirement is something that it really is changing and um, and likely it needs to change. Um, we're living longer than we ever have in all of human history. And because of that, uh, we have this sort of term that's become a bit anachronistic, that's become associated with age. And yet the age that people retire, uh, you know, is not keeping up with life expectancy. Mm -hmm. And so, I think, you know, the, I, I plot out in, in, the, in my book, you know, the gap that has emerged between average retirement age um, in, in many parts of the world and how and our life expectancy, which has just gone up and up and up. And, and with that comes, I think, a real need to, to rethink what retirement is and what we want it to be. You've been listening to The Annex an academic sociology podcast. You can visit our show site at sociocast.org slash annex. We are on Twitter at Sociannex and on Facebook, the Annex Sociology Podcast. Our producer is Laseth Moreno. Music by Lena Orsa. I'm Joseph Cohen. Thank you for listening. Thank you.